Good morning, Richwoods. It is almost time to worship. So grab your coffee, grab your tea, grab your drink, and make your way into the worship center this morning. We'd love to know you're worshiping with us and the ways we can be walking alongside you. One great way to do that is through filling out the Connect card that is in the seat back right in front of you. On these cards, you can update your contact information, you can share a prayer request, or consider taking a next step. One of those next steps is the journey of discipleship. God is moving in some cool ways and has new opportunities coming to be involved in our journey as apprentices of Him. One thing for those already involved in discipleship is just a reminder that we have a guide training coming up uh, here in a few weeks. Be sure to respond to my email or sign up for those trainings. You won't want to miss this opportunity to connect with other guides and be equipped in your journey as a disciple guide. You can take those cards and you can drop them in the black boxes on your way out of the worship center. Or if you are brand new with us, hang on to those cards and bring it with you to Connection Point where we'd love to meet you and get a gift in your hand. And speaking of being brand new, today, after second service, we have Richwoods Connect. This is a great place to learn more about us, for us to learn more about you, and to get you connected here at Richwoods. There is lunch and childcare, so we invite you to join us for that, even if you haven't signed up previously. We also want to invite you to join us in living out our values of being joy-filled givers. We love to say yes to our generous God in, in as many ways as possible. Right now, our building is full of exciting renovations happening, and it's because of your joy-filled giving. There are also many ways to give and be part of what God is doing both inside and outside of these walls. We want to be a church that is prayer saturated, and there's an opportunity to join us in this calling at our next prayer night coming up on April 24th at 6.30 p.m. Join us for an hour of time together where we can take Jesus up on his invitation to come away with me to a quiet place and get some rest. There will be refreshments and childcare up through kindergarten. We're also excited for the start of what is called the choir gathering. Let's hear from Jeremiah as he shares a little bit more about what this gathering is all about. Hello everyone, my name is Jeremiah Soleil. I'm the worship pastor um, at Richwoods Christian Church. Uh, I just wanted to invite you into something. The choir gathering, you heard it, choir. Choir has been historically a gathering of people, um, sometimes in robes, sometimes holding a folder and singing melodies and harmonies and song and music unto the Lord. Well, we get to do that together, but it's not gonna be choir robes and there's no need for folders or anything. I just want all of you guys to show up to this gathering. Uh, the first gathering will be April 25th here at Richwood starting at 6 p.m. You heard it. And I hope that this time is a time of fellowship, a time where we can come together and sing and just lift up praises to the Lord. Uh, we're, we're also going to dive into leading worship and praise and worship and what those things are and why it is important in, in what we do. This is not for, you know, the perfect singing vocalist. This is not just for worship team or band people. This is for everyone. You, whether you can sing the highest note or whether you are singing a joyful noise I want you there please come and be a part of this gathering I hope to see you there thank you we are so glad you joined us for worship this morning let's stand and worship together good morning what? good morning yeah. why don't you turn to somebody you know, turn to somebody you don't know. Tell them good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. We're just going to start out just declaring who God is. Um, this song says, you're the great I am. And uh, just that phrase, that name for the Lord says so much. It, it seems like it says so little, but it says so much. You know, it just says that God exists, that he is the all in all, that he was and is and is to come. He's just, he is. Um, so let that sink in as we declare that together.
Something that we hang on to because life does not make sense. In the chaos and the craziness of what is our day to day, let me assure you that there is hope and his name is Jesus. That we can't do this life the way that we were meant to without it. And each and every week here at Richwoods, we take intentional time to just be still, just sit for a moment, to worship him, to continue to worship him in a way that is so intimate because Jesus sees us exactly who we are in our mess, in our fear, in our joy, in our sorrows, he sees you. And he wants a relationship with you. He went to the cross for us. He held his arms out to carry the weight of the world. And we sometimes forget that he is constantly standing right before us with his arms open wide, asking us to just come, to just come. And I'm not sure how you came in today, but we are glad you're here. And we hope that in the next few moments as we take our cracker and juice together, you can just come to Jesus. Maybe in a way you never have before. 
but know that no matter what, he is still pursuing you. Our sin held him to the cross. His goodness, his mercy, and the hope that we have is what took him there in the first place. So we're gonna pray for our elements for the cracker and juice that represent his blood and his body. And we are just gonna have a moment with our Jesus. He conquered the grave. And he is the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever because his promises never fail. Never. There may be a place right now where you're saying, but I have this thing, never does he fail. May not look the way that we want, may not feel the way that we want, but his goodness and his grace are so real. And he wants to hear from you. So let's pray for our elements. Lord, your goodness we don't understand. we cannot comprehend. Your unconditional love is so foreign in a world full of opinions and hate. We cannot thank you enough for the sacrifice that you made for us on the cross. Lord, we thank you so much for the hope that we have in you. That as we continue to walk in your dust and become apprentices after you, that we will more than ever become completely dependent on what you have for us. We thank you for pursuing us. We thank you for your arms being wide open to fall into. Lord, we are so grateful for your forgiveness and your mercy when we feel like we can do it better. Lord, we can't. We need you. Thank you for going to the cross and conquering death. Thank you for seeing us exactly how you've created us to be and loving us so much. And Lord, in the next few moments, as our hearts just connect with you, help us to be open to what you're calling us to. We pray that our voices will just be sweet worship to you. We love you. We thank you for this time that we have together. We pray all of it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You can go ahead and take your cracker and juice. join us as we worship in this next song. Um, It's called I've Witnessed It. And I can't help but think of all that God has done. All the things I've witnessed in my short little lifespan and yet all the things that he's done for thousands of years. Um, And so as we worship and we sing this song, just I want you to think of those things that God has done for you. The wonderful works and the deeds. Um, Let's speak of his name today. In every 
There you go. Thanks, Doug. Good morning. How's everybody doing? My name is Chad. I'm the lead pastor here at Richwoods, uh, and I have the honor of introducing our speaker today. Sometimes uh, God gives us so many gifts and so many promises and so many good things, right? That's what that song is all about, right? You're good, and I've seen it. I've got stories I live to tell your love, and I've seen it. Like, how do you know the love of God? Because I've felt it, I've seen it, I've experienced it, I've witnessed it in others. One of the ways that God gives incredible gifts is through relationships with people. And when we moved here over three and a half years ago during the pandemic, God knew that for my lead pastor career here, for my friendships within this city, for my life, for my ministry, that there was a man of God that I desperately needed. And I didn't see him coming. He came in like a whirlwind, as you're about to find out when he preaches. But he came into my life, and I'm telling you, I'm a better pastor, a better husband, a better father, uh, and an overall better apprentice of Jesus because of this guy being in my life. Uh, he is the lead pastor of City on a Hill Church downtown. He's also the lead chaplain for Peoria Fire Department, which technically makes him my boss, which is weird. But thank you, sir, for welcoming coming today. Uh, but you have a wonderful, wonderful gift coming your way this morning. You will be so happy I am not preaching. Uh, it is with joy that I bring my friend and brother, Pastor William Preston. Can we welcome him? Good morning, Richwoods. All right, that was 10 of y'all. Let's try it again. Good morning, Richwoods. All right, now we got a little bit better participation. Good to see you all this morning. It's good to uh, be here with you. Uh, this surprise visit uh, to come and be with you uh, on today. Uh, I, this time last week, I didn't know that I was going to be here, uh, but God had a different plan. Pastor Chad uh, reached out to me and felt like God was in this, and I told him, we'll see. So uh, we, we uh, experienced God's presence and power in the Word this morning, and uh, I hope that we will do the same uh, in this service today. So I'm really grateful um, for this opportunity. I'm grateful uh, for my friendship with Chad, uh, the same way that uh, he spoke very highly of me, which I appreciate. Uh, that blessing has been mutual, um, and I'm so grateful for the friendship uh, that we get to share. I'm thankful uh, for this season that we get to serve together uh, in ministry with the fire department and serve uh, the city of Peoria in that unique manner. Um, and it's a blessing that he is exemplifying, manifesting uh, your vision as a church to be for uh, the city. And I just absolutely love that. Uh, that as a man of God, he's not one that just tells you what to do, but he's doing that. He's walking that out and living that by example. And he has been a major uh, asset to the chaplaincy for uh, the fire department. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, the last thing I want to say before we get into the word today is I just want to encourage you and affirm to you that God is working in this church. I, thought I would get more than five amens on that one, but... Let me try this side over here. God is working in this church. All right. This is the side I wanted, right? All right. But, but you need to know that God is at work in Richwoods. He really is. And it's not just the physical manifestations of changes and renovations that hap that's happening. God is doing some amazing things in terms of people who are coming to know Jesus people who are growing in discipleship, the impact that you're having on the city and places around you. It is an amazing work that God is doing. And so I just want to bless you in that. However you participate in the ministry and vision of this church, I bless you uh, in that. And if you're not uh, participating in the ministry of this church, I encourage you to do so because God is at work. I want to, this is uh, not in the message, but I'm going to toss it on your porch since I'm in the neighborhood. Uh, but John chapter 2 um, is the first recorded miracle in the Bible. It's the wedding of Cana, and Jesus is there, and uh, you probably are familiar with the story. They run out of wine. They don't have enough wine for the guests, uh, and Jesus is going to do this miracle. He tells the servants uh, to put water in the water pot. The end of the story is that the, the, the water turned into wine, wine and the rest of the guests uh, will continue to go on with their partying, right? Here's what I think we fail to realize about that story. 
the only ones who actually got to experience the miracle were the servants. Okay? Everybody else was a recipient of the miracle. They got the result of the miracle, but the only ones that actually got to experience the miracle were the ones who were serving. And I want to challenge you today as you are here, are you just a recipient of the miracles that God is doing? Or are you just a benefactor of the miracles that God is doing here? Or are you a part of it? Are you actually getting to experience what God is doing? And the only way you can get to experience the miracles that God is doing, you got to be serving. You got to be involved. You've got to be laying your life down in ministry. And then you not only get to see what God is doing and see the result of what God is doing, you get to experience it. And it's really as beautiful. And so I just want to encourage you all uh, in that today. So we're going to get into the Word of God here, if you would. Uh, let's just pause and pray um, for a moment. Um, Father God, I thank you for this opportunity uh, to speak your Word today. What an awesome privilege! Um, it is to share that which is spirit and that which is life. Uh, so my prayer, God, is that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, that it would be pleasing and acceptable to thee. You are my strength and you are my redeemer. And I pray that my words would not fall to the ground today, but that it would rest on hearts that are ready to receive and ready to obey. And so, God, we ask in this moment that you just have your way in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. All right. Uh, on last week, your pastor uh, started in a new series, a new focus on cheat codes, uh, keys to apprenticeship uh, with Jesus. Um, not only is it a great focus in terms of series, but um, just a remarkable message on last week uh, in that he pointed us to one of the keys of being an apprentice of Jesus is to start with being an apprentice of Jesus, right? It's simplifying. Simplicity is one of the greatest keys that you can have to your walk with Jesus in your ministry, um, and especially in being apprentices and learning to, to live like him, to serve like him, uh, to advance the kingdom like him. You've got to learn to simplify. You can't keep going uh, uh, full of anxiety and the care of the world and all of the different stressors of life and think that you're going to uh, be a good apprentice of Jesus Christ. And so uh, simplicity uh, becomes a key. Um, and in particular, he shared there was three aspects of that simplicity. Number one, a simple mindset. And that simple mindset is to seek and to set, right? To seek and to set. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 1, if you then be risen with Christ, then seek those things that are above. And you set your mind on heavenly things, not just the things of the earth. There is something more uh, that your mind is consumed with. So there's a simple mindset. But he also talked about simple math, right? And simple math is that less is actually more. Right? You don't get more by adding more things and doing more things, but you actually accomplish more by taking some things away, by simplifying your time, your schedule, your lifestyle, all of those different things. If you want to see the more that God has for you, you've got to uh, uh, make sure that you have uh, that, that simplistic mindset. All right, but you not only have to have that simple mindset and that simple math, you got to have a simple posture, right? And that posture is to look to Jesus and let go. Look to Jesus and let go. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. And so we surrender to his sovereignty. We surrender to his lordship. And we let go of our need, our desire to control. Um, as Pastor Chaz said last week, there's, we, we don't control very much anyway, as much as we would like to think we're in control. But uh, apprenticeship to Jesus looks like us a surrendering to him and to his lordship and letting uh, the need for control go. And he ended last week talking about pursuing uh, engagement and how that simplicity gives way to us being able to see people to engage people, to love on people, and to serve people uh, the way that we have been called to. And that's the key that we're going to look at in, speci uh, in specifics today is that engagement. Let me hear you say engagement. engagement. All right, that was about 50% of y'all. Let's try it again. Engagement. engagement. 
All right, we're actually practicing the very thing we're talking about right now, right? So engagement. Uh, we, we want to be people that pursue engagement, and that is a key to apprenticeship with Jesus. If you are an apprentice to an electrician, you're not caught off guard or surprised by being expected to carry bundles of wire right? If you're an apprentice to a plumber, you don't get offended because you got wet one day. If you are an apprentice to an accountant, you don't say numbers aren't my thing. I don't do numbers, right? No, those are things that come along with that level in those different aspects of apprenticeship. And so it is, if we're going to be apprentices of Jesus, guess what? You don't find it strange that people, Jesus says you must engage people. You don't find it an offense that you've got to deal with the challenges and the messes of people and their lives and their situations. When you are an apprentice of Jesus, you don't say, I don't do the people thing. I don't do relationships, right? No, because the, one of the main objectives of ministry with Jesus is people. It's people. That's one of the main objectives. And so if we're going to be good apprentices of Jesus Christ, we must have this key of engagement. Uh, I want to look at a passage of scripture today um, that your pastor gave me um, in terms of this message. First Corinthians chapter two, uh, verses one through five. We're going to read it. But before I say that, um, I just got to tell you how your pastor set me up today. So he texts me and, and says, you know, this whole Holy Spirit thing that I'm supposed to preach today and all of this stuff. And all right, cool, chat. Well, what, what's going on? I try to enter into the flow of the house and what's happening. What do I need to talk about? So he gives me 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, only to give me the caveat that these are some of his favorite scriptures in all of the New Testament. And I'm like, bro, you really had to do me like that, right? And it reminded me of when I met my wife, right? One of the things I did when I first met my wife, I went and got a raw chicken and took it to her house and said, what can you do with this? And I feel like he gave me these scriptures so he could sit down today and say, what can you do with this? So we're going to see what God does uh, with it. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Here's what it says. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear. And in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The first thing that ju literally jumped off the page to me when I began to sit with that text for just a minute, it only took just a couple minutes for me to see engagement written all, all over it because Paul literally says, and I, when I came to you. So the first thing that I want you to understand would we'll just jump right to it is he went to them. Let me hear you say that. He went to them. Say it again. He went to them. All right, we're getting the engagement down a little bit. Let's try it again. He went to them. All right, that's better. He went to them, right? When you go to somebody, it requires you to leave where you are. It requires you to leave what you're doing, to leave what you're occupied with. And Paul could have been occupied with a lot of different things. He was in Athens at the time, and this is now his second missionary journey where he's going to go to Corinth, and he's going to engage people that he's never met before. He doesn't have relationship with them. There's probably things that he He's heard about the Corinthians because Corinth was a major metropolis. So not only is there a lot of business and a lot of activity going on, but you would also have to imagine there's a lot of sin. There's a lot of wickedness. There's a lot of things that are going on in this major city of Corinth. So what in the world would cause Paul to leave wherever he was, to leave what he was doing and go to them and go and engage these people? I want to suggest that he did that because because he was called to do it. Let me hear you say he was called. 
He was called to do it. Let's look at how he starts this whole ch- this whole book, this letter. First Corinthians chapter one, verse number one. It says, "Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ and our brother Sosthenes." He introduces himself as one who has been called by the will of Jesus to be an apostle. So watch this. When Paul goes to Corinth, he does not go to Corinth simply because he's an outgoing person and he likes engagement with other people. That might be his personality. I don't know, but that's not why he went to them. He did not go to Corinth because it was simply a sociological experiment. He didn't go to Corinth because it was a philanthropic endeavor. He went to Corinth because he was summoned by God. He was called by God. When it says he was called, that means that there was an invitation that was given to him, an invitation into opportunity and an invitation into responsibility. Well, what was he called to? Well, listen to that verse again. Paul called by Jesus Christ, by the will of Jesus Christ to be an an apostle. What is an apostle? The simple definition of an apostle is a sent one. One who is sent, S-E-N-T, sent one, one who is sent. So Paul literally got an invitation, a calling, a summons from God to be sent out by God. Now that meant that Paul had to treasure and value the calling it, what, what he was called to more than he did whatever he was doing or whatever his preoccupation could be. Paul was a tent maker by trade, so he could have put more time into his business. He could have put more time into his craft. I don't know if Paul was a people person or not a people person, but, but either way it goes, when he got this invitation, when he got this call, I believe he also got the revelation of what was most important in ministry, and that was people. Paul had a revelation of how important people are. Paul knew that when he stood before the Lord Jesus, he wasn't going to be able to brag about the biggest tents that he had made. He wasn't going to be able to brag about the chariot that he rides in or how much education he had received. I know that he felt this way because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, here's what he says. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming is it not you. You are our glory and joy. Paul understood that was more what was more important than houses, cars, boats, portfolios, your retirement, your family trips, or anything else was what he did with people. What he did with people, he was called to people. So he lays down his life, he lays down his business, he lays down his preoccupation so that he can go and engage people. May I suggest to us today that just like Paul, we have been summoned, we have been invited into an opportunity. We have been invited into a responsibility, and that is to be sent ones. No, we are not apostles in title. We are not apostles uh, uh, in, in status or office, but we have been called to be sent ones. We hear that in Jesus's uh, call to his disciples before he goes uh, back to heaven in Matthew chapter 28 when he says to them, go therefore and, and, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always into the end of the earth. That's a command to us. We call it the great command, com, uh, commission. And, and, and that is a commission to us to be sent ones. If that's not enough, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and then verse 20. In verse 18, it says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and now he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. In verse number 20, it says, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ Jesus. So we must have the attitude that Isaiah even had hundreds of years ago when he says, here am I, send me. We have been called to be those 
sent one. So that means we've got to go to them. We've got to leave our preoccupations. We've got to leave the things that distract us and that are of lesser value to understand we have a ministry to engage people. And we have to see it as so valuable and so fruitful that we know that when Jesus returns, there's nothing else that we are going to be able to brag about. You won't be able to brag about the house that you built. He's got one that has mansions inside of it. All right, you won't be able to to, to boast about your car. He rides on flaming chariots. All right, y'all still not getting it yet. You won't be able to talk about your stock, your portfolio, your investments. His driveway is made out of gold. I'm just trying to tell you there's nothing really you can boast about but people. When Jesus comes back, what you're going to be able to say is how you loved people, how you served people, how you gave to people, how you walked with people, how you prayed with people. That's what he has called us to engagement. Amen. But I need you to understand that it's not just enough that we go. It's not just enough that we engage. But what's really important is how we engage. That, that, that's really the key here is how we engage people. As apprentices of Jesus Christ, we must not only be concerned with the end result, but we've got to be concerned with the means that gets us there. All right. It's not just a check the box we engage. It's not just a check the box. I had a conversation. But the question is how? How did you engage? And you know the reason why this matters? Two reasons why this matters. Your calling and your goal. Your calling and your goal, right? Because we should want to engage people not because we're merely outgoing people, not merely because, oh, it's a cool thing to do and this is what Rich Woods is doing and this is our vision. No, we want to engage people because God has called us to it, right? This is the invitation that he's given us into opportunity and responsibility. So because of him who called me, there's a certain way I engage people. There's a certain way I talk to people, a certain way that I interact with them because of the one who called me and what he called me to. But the other reason why this is important is the end result that I'm after. And as an apprentice of Jesus Christ, what is the end result? Paul gave it to us in 1 Corinthians 2, the very last verse that we read, verse number 5. Here's what it says uh, in verse number 5. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. See, we've got to get to the point that how we engage people always points them to Jesus. We've got to engage people in such a way that when we walk away from that conversation, from that interaction, they are not enamored with us. That they don't want to merely see more of us and keep talking to us. But there's something that they have felt, experienced, heard in us that says, I must know more of him. And if when you get done engaging someone, all they're left with is you, you have missed the whole point of apprenticeship. It really is about him. It's about pointing people to a person, Jesus. It's about pointing them to his power, the power to forgive, the power to set free, the power to give them eternal life. That can't come from anywhere else. And so we want them to have faith in God. We want them to stretch out on God. That's really what it means to rest. To, to rest in the power of God. Um, it, when I, whenever I see that resting like that in scripture, it takes me back uh, to one of my jobs before I started doing ministry. Um, I used to be a patient transporter in the hospital. And when I was doing patient transportation in the hospital, um, there was a couple different ways that we would transport people. And you're familiar with this. There are some people that they can be pushed in a wheelchair. You know where they're going. And the people that can be pushed in a wheelchair, they're strong enough to make transitions, right? And so in other words, you push the, the chair into the room, they can get up off the bed. They can move to the chair. They can make those small transitions. But you've got to push them for the long haul. Right. But there are also some people that when you show up to their room to take them to X-ray, MRI or wherever they're going surgery, you you show up with with a gurney. Right. You show up with the bed because you're going to transition them from one bed to another and you're rolling them where they're going, which means they're just resting with you. 
right? They're letting you take care of it. You're going wherever, they're going wherever you're taking them. That's what I think about when it comes to rest. Some of us have the wheelchair type of faith that we want to make the transitions and then let God coast us the rest of the way. We want to make the decisions and then say, God, push us and advance what it is that I'm doing. But what real faith and real trust looks like is stretching out on him saying, it's your show. You take me wherever you want to go. You do with me whatever you want to do. I think this is the mindset of the proverb writer in Proverbs chapter 3 when he says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will what? Direct your path. He'll take you where it is you need to go. So it is if we understand that, we will always engage people with that end goal in mind, that we don't want to leave them dependent or resting on us, but we want to point them to the person of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that? So, so Paul then gives us five principles to this key of engagement. He gives us five principles that we should look at in terms of when we pursue engagement with people, what what should we be looking for? What is the how of how we go about that? But before we look at that, I want you to hear uh, these words here as followers, apprentices of Jesus Christ. And I know I'm messing up the whole media team because I'm going out of order now. But as followers and apprentices of Jesus, there's a certain heart approach and focus we should have when pursuing engagement with others, especially those outside of the faith. Let that rest with you. As followers, apprentices of Jesus, there's a certain heart, approach, and focus we should have when pursuing engagement with others, especially those outside of the faith. Can I just throw this in for those outside of the faith? I believe it was Mahatma Gandhi who said this, I love your Christ, I don't like your Christianity. And that's powerful when we think about it, of how we're representing Jesus. It's not so much Jesus that people have a problem with, but it's the representation of Jesus. It's what it looks like in our lives, in in our uh, words, in all of that. And so we must understand there's a certain heart, approach, and focus that we have when pursuing engagement with others, especially those that are outside our faith. We want to be uh, uh, careful. We want to be cautious. We want to be spiritually wise in how we engage people. And Paul gives us those principles or how we are to do it. Uh, let's look at them real quick. Number one, he says that when I was with, with you, it was without lofty words. It was without lofty words. The word lofty there comes from the Greek word huperake. And Hooper Ake paints the picture of one that is in prominence or preeminence and superiority. So when Paul says, I I was with you not with lofty words, here's the Preston form of that. Here's what Paul was saying. My vocab and and my vibe didn't place me above people. Did y'all get that? My vocab nor my vibe placed me above people. It didn't put me in superiority to people. Watch this. If people have to climb mentally, emotionally, or otherwise to engage you, then your apprenticeship is looking wrong. How do you know that? Because Philippians chapter 2, here's what we see in our master rabbi. Philippians chapter 2, the Bible said that he condescended to men of low estate. So in terms of how we engage people, it's not them coming up to us, but us coming where they are. Watch this, which means that if I'm going to not use lofty words, I got to know a little something of the person that I'm engaging. I've, I've got to listen more than I'm talking. Maybe that's why James said to be quick to what? Hear and slow to speak because I got to make sure that I'm talking in a way that connects with the person that they understand and my vocab nor my vibe has placed me above them in any type of way. And in order to do that, I've got to listen. I got to know who I'm engaging. I got to know where they're at, right? And so Paul said, I didn't come with a bunch of words and trying to impress people with my vocabulary, my conversation, my concepts, 
none of that. I just want to speak plain so people can understand me, and I don't use words that are over people's head, and neither do I have a mindset that puts me over their head. Paul says, when I was with you, it was without lofty words. What good is it that you talk to people well, but they never get an understanding from what you say? I get it. You're educated. I, I get that your vocab is quite extensive, but the question is, when you get done explaining all of what you're explaining, does the other person understand any of what you gave them? Okay, and so Paul says, I was with you without lofty words. Here's number two. He says, I, when I was with you, I decided to know nothing but Jesus alone. Knowing Jesus alone. The, the, the first part of what Paul is saying here is that he understood what was of most value. He understood what was most important. He actually mentions this in chapter 15 of the same letter, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. He said, I delivered to you that which was of first importance. What was of first importance? That Jesus died according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. Paul said that's what he chose to know among them was Christ, his cross, the power of his resurrection. Now, it's important to understand that this was a decision Paul made. Paul said, I decided to know nothing among you but Jesus alone. Why is that important that Paul decided to know nothing but Jesus alone? Because you have to understand that Paul, his level of education as a Pharisee, his level of education as he sat at the feet, uh, the feet of other rabbis, Paul was a, a very educated man. So by the time Paul would have turned 21, he would have had the equivalent of what would be like two PhDs in theology. So Paul was a very learned and educated man, which meant that he could have had conversation with people and he could have expostulated all the pericopes of religion and philosophy. But he decided to know nothing among them but Jesus alone because he understood we can get all into these conversations about philosophy, about all of this stuff, and at the end of the day, what matters more than anything is Jesus. What matters more than anything is the fact that he died for you. He was buried and he rose again for you. And if we understand that we are apprentices of Jesus, that's what becomes most important in our engagement with people is that we never miss that everything flows from him and everything flows to him. He says, when I was with you, I decided to know nothing but Jesus alone. Here's number three. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and much trembling. Not only is it a principle of engagement that we would not use lofty words. Not only does the principle of engagement that we would want to know nothing but Jesus alone in these conversations and engagements, but a third one is really are you prepared to be vulnerable with people? In, in the world we live in, in the society we live in, strength is complemented, right? We want to be strong. We want to be tenacious, we, we, we want to endure, right? We, we, we laud strength. We complement strength. So we don't want to be weak. So you know what happens in our times of weakness, in our times of fear, in our times of trepidation? We try to hide that from other people. And we do what, what we do as human beings. We put on our best face, right? But as an apprentice of Jesus Christ, you don't put on your best face. You put on the real one. Preach, pastor. I think I will. You, you don't put on your best face. You put on your real one. Pa Paul came to understand that it wasn't his strength. He was trying to show people and how strong he was and how good he was and, and how faithful of a Christian was. But Paul came to the fact to the point where he says, I would rather glory in my weaknesses. Why is that? So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And some of us try so hard to hide the things we struggle with. 
And if I can just tell you for a moment, as an apprentice of Jesus Christ, you don't have to hide. As an apprentice of Jesus Christ, you don't even have to let your realities of weakness, of fear, of much trembling, you don't have to let that keep you from engaging people, but actually you would engage people with those realities. Sometimes it's in your vulnerability that you win people more than what you even realize. Sometimes it's admitting, I'm scared right now. Sometimes it's admitting, I don't know what it is that I'm going to do. Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul had the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul got caught up to the third heaven, right, and and was experiencing all of that, and he could still admit there was times he was weak, there was times he was fearful, there was times he was trembling much. If, If Paul couldn't get around the weakness, fear, and trembling, what makes you think we're going to? And I think as an apprentice of Jesus Christ, he's giving you an invitation into weakness. He's giving you an invitation to understand, watch this, to understand one of the number one things that will connect you to other people that you try to engage is, watch this, they're hurting just like you are. They're hurting just like you have been. And when you can come and be with them and engage them and you don't hide, you don't duck, you don't dodge because you've got weakness, because you've got fear, because you've got these things going on, but you actually would pursue engagement despite those things, that's what it means to be an apprentice of Jesus Christ. Isn't it interesting? Watch this. The shortest verse in the Bible, John 11.35, Jesus wept. You got it. Shortest verse in the Bible tells us a reality about Jesus. And when you look at the context of that, it was when Lazarus died, right? And and he knows he's getting ready to raise him from the dead, but yet he cries anyway over the death. Here's the point I want you to see, though. When he cried, he didn't excuse himself. (laughs) Right? He was vulnerable with his disciples. He was vulnerable with those who were around him. He didn't excuse himself to have a moment. Now, does that mean that every single person should be invited into every moment and every uh, experience of our vulnerability? Absolutely not. But I want to just tell you there's a new way, there's a different way of engaging people in the spirit of Jesus. And it's not you put on your best face and pretend like you're strong and pretend like you got it all together, but rather you would be okay with being vulnerable and say, I don't have to be strong because God is. I don't actually have to have it all together because he does. And because my end game, watch this, is so that they rest in the power of God and not in me, it doesn't really matter if I'm weak anyway. Right? It doesn't really matter if I'm in fear, if I'm trembling, because my whole goal was to point them to him. So sometimes the way that I do that is come here and let's lay on Jesus' lap together. I'm weak just like you. I'm, tr- I'm, I'm scared just like you. I don't know what's going to happen just like you. But I can point you to the one who knows what's going to happen. I can point you to the one who's in control. I can point you to the one that I go to for comfort and strength in the midst of it. Here's number four. Paul said, when I was with you, I just had a plain message. I just had a plain message. Where did that come from? He says that my words or my message was not with plausible words of men's wisdom. That word plausible means enticing. In other words, Paul says, I don't spend, even with all his education, with all his revelation, with all that Paul knew and had, Paul said, I don't put a lot of time trying to craft messages and presentations that will be cunning, that will, that will uh, placate people, that will conciliate people, that will pacify people. Paul said, that's not what this is. He actually is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ask or think, so I just put it out there and let God use it. 
I, I want to encourage somebody today that as an apprentice of Jesus Christ and how you engage other people, you don't have to have a perfectly polished message. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to have all the book, chapter, and verses. Do you trust in the power of God enough that you would just give a plain message that Jesus died for you, he, he was buried, he rose again because he loves you, and he's able to give you eternal life if you put your trust in him can you just give people a plain message and expect that God will do the rest do you have enough faith to understand that God does not need you to save a life but he chooses to use you and he just wants you to give a plain message the power is not in you the power is not in your words the power is is in him, which leads me to my last point. Paul says that I, when I was with you, he says it was in demonstration of the power of God. In demonstration of the power of God. Couple things that you need to understand about this demonstration of the power of God. The first thing is that as an apprentice of Jesus Christ, you've got to move from the place of conversation to demonstration. We, we can't just be all talk. As Christians, as believers, we can't just be all talk. We can't just have the gospel and the scriptures and the answers and, and all of that. We can't just be all talk. There must be a demonstration. Faith without works is what? It's dead, being alone. And so as apprentices of Jesus, we, 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 how do we engage people? In demonstration of the power of God. We don't just talk about it. We actually let them see it at work in our our life. Well, how does that begin to happen? That happens with you being surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The, the, the thing that Pastor Chad was talking about last week, looking to Jesus and letting go, that's where it starts. Because when I look to Jesus and let go, here's what happens. He fills me with his spirit, and as he fills me with his spirit, the power of God begins to flow in and out of my life. That's where the demonstration comes from. But here's the other thing that this is showing us. Because when Paul talks about a demonstration of the power of God, the dunamis of God, this, this miracle working power of God, here's what he's saying. Your engagements should not merely be natural in their essence. But rather your engagement with people now moves from a mere natural experience to a supernatural experience. How, pastor, do I demonstrate the power of God? How do I do that as an apprentice of Jesus? How do I engage people in a way that it demonstrates the power of God? Three things real quick that you can do to demonstrate the power of God. And it's not by you. It's by God's spirit in you. But here's number one, your fruit. Let me hear you say fruit. I thought we worked on engagement earlier. Let's see if the back of the room will engage, all right? Let me hear you say fruit. All right, that sounds a little bit better. Now, some of y'all are still resisting me, and that's all right, but, but I just want to get you some practice in because that's what we're called to with people, right, to come out of our comfort zone, to sometimes say and do things that we don't want to say or that we don't want to do. I know some of you sit there and say, everybody else is going to respond, so I don't have to, but your voice adds to it. And you got to understand that that's what God does in his kingdom too. You can't sit back and wait on other people to engage, wait on other people to go. He's created you uniquely, you, and you've got a voice, you've got fruit that God wants to show and demonstrate to others how he works. What, what, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, the fruit that the Spirit gives is, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, all of those things, you demonstrate the power of God when people see those things that work in your life. When other people are losing their mind, when all hell is breaking loose and they're running around frantic and don't know what to do, don't know where to go, and, and they're popping pills and drinking and all of these other things, what gives you peace in the midst of the storm? The Spirit of God. And when people see you 
In the midst of the storm, calm, cool, collected, and the storm is not rattling you. They're going to want to know why are you not losing your mind? Why are you not going crazy? Why are you not stressed out? That's the demonstration of the power of God. He brings that fruit about in our lives. Not only do you need fruit as a demonstration of the power of God, but you need giftings. Let me hear you say giftings. Oh, y'all got it that time. All right, awesome. Yeah, we got giftings, giftings. And, and, and great, you can cook. Great, you know how to clean real good. Great that you're a great driver. But I'm not talking about those skills and abilities. I'm not talking about those giftings. I'm talking about the ones that Holy Spirit give you. And when you start to move in your giftings, it demonstrates to people the power of God because you're only able to do those things by the power of God's spirit. If you can do that thing in your own strength and in your flesh, it probably is not a spiritual gifting. Because the, mere, the definition, basic definition of a spiritual gift is the spirit has to empower it. The spirit has to produce it. And when you allow the giftings of God to flow through you, people see the demonstration of the power of God. Can I just stretch you a little bit today that I want to submit to, to Rich Woods that your eyes have not seen. Your ears haven't heard. And for some of you, it haven't even entered into your imagination what God wants to do in you and what God wants to do through you. I believe that God wants to heal people and he wants to do it through you. God wants to deliver people and he wants to do it through you. God wants to change lives around and he wants to do it through you. He wants demon-possessed people delivered and he wants to do it through you. God wants wants you to show a demonstration of his power. Not only do you need fruit, not only do you need your giftings, but here's the third thing, how you show the demonstration of the power of God. It's your testimony. Let me hear you say testimony. Man, it gets better and better. It gets better and better. Look at your neighbor. Let's try engagement this way. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you have a testimony. I hope y'all didn't ride together and don't like talking to each other. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you need a testimony. Look back at that neighbor and say, neighbor, you have a testimony. Look back at him one more time and say, neighbor, that testimony is a demonstration of the power of God. All right, some of y'all still not getting it yet, so let me try it this way, and I'm done. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I like kids' movies, and, and even as an adult, I like kids' movies, and I like enjoying them. And there's one in particular that came out in the late 90s uh, that Eddie Murphy played in called Dr. Doolittle. Y'all remember Dr. Doolittle? Let me talk about it for just a moment. Dr. Doolittle had this uh, power, this ability uh, to be able to hear animals and, and to know what was going on with animals and he thought he was going crazy when he was hearing these animals uh, but one day he takes his family out to this cabin and they're on vacation and while he's outside an owl, owl comes to him and the owl says I got something in my wing Can it's hurting me can you take it out of me and Dr. Doolittle took the stick out of the owl's wing and the owl was so grateful and so appreciative to what, for what Dr. Doolittle did so here's how the I'll pay Dr. Doolittle back. She went and told all the animals what Dr. Doolittle could do. She said, he can hear us. He can understand us. And not only that, he's a doctor. He can help us. Now that the owl went and told her testimony, now the living room fills up with all of these animals and Dr. Doolittle is busy. There was a couple of pigeons who had relationship issues and Dr. Doolittle helped them with their relationship. There was a monkey who had a drinking problem and Dr. Doolittle helped him with his drinking problem. There was a horse who couldn't see and Dr. Doolittle made him glasses so that he could see. There was a tiger who was suicidal and Dr. Doolittle turned his life around and he found reason to live and have hope. I hope y'all know that I didn't come to talk about Dr. Doolittle, but I came to talk about Dr. Jesus. And some of us have testimonies about Dr. Jesus. 
us. Some of us can tell people, I had something inside of me that was hurting me, but Jesus took it out of me. Some of us can say we had habits and addictions that we couldn't get over, but God dried them up. Some of us can say we were blind and we couldn't see, but God gave us sight. Some of us were suicidal and we saw no reason to live, but God gave us hope. I'm here today to tell you your testimony is a demonstration of the power of God. Hallelujah. You've got to run and tell it. You can't hide what God has done for you. You can't hide what God has brought you out of. You can't hide all of the ways he's made. We just sung a song a little bit ago that said, I've witnessed it. I've seen your faithfulness. I've seen your constancy. I've seen your love. And I'm here to tell you today, let the redeem of the Lord say so. You got to start saying something about what God has done in your life. Your testimony is the demonstration of the power of God. How else will people know what God can do? How else will people know all of the ways he's made unless you testify? Paul says as apprentices of Jesus Christ, the how we engage people is super important. We should value not having lofty words. We should value knowing Jesus alone. We should value being with people in weakness. We should value, even in fear and trembling, being with people. We should have a plain message, and we should demonstrate the power of God. When we do that, we please our master rabbi. When we do that, not only do we bring pleasure to him, but we represent him well to the people that we're engaging. And the kingdom of God continues to expand for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Would you stand to your feet with me? Father, I thank you. I give you praise for how you are at work. I I praise you for your word. I praise you even in advance for the things that will come about from application of your word. I pray grace upon every individual under the sound of my voice. I pray grace upon this church as a whole that they would continue to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, that they would be accurate representations of Jesus Christ at home, at work, in the city. I pray that we would so conduct ourselves that people's faith would rest in the power of God and not in the wisdom of man. Continue to bless this church as they go through this series and all that you're going to teach and reveal, help them to process it, help them to walk in it for your glory and for your good. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you.
It was a week ago, uh, right after second service, I felt like clear as day, the Holy Spirit of God pressed in my heart that you're not supposed to preach next week. And that is rare. That is rare. I'm very scheduled. If you ask these guys, I've got who's preaching for the next year laid out, like it's done. And I knew it was one of my favorite passages. And I mean, you did okay with it. Um, <laughs> don't fire me from the fire department. Um, but man, it is so good to know that God still speaks to his people because I can glory in him that what he told me last Sunday was exactly what we needed, mm -hmm. that I could not bring the message that this man needed to bring. So thank you for being here, Pastor Preston. Just a couple announcements before we leave. We are so glad that you are here. And if you are brand new with us, we would love to meet you right over here at our connection point. Put a gift in your hand. Right after this service, we are having our next Richwoods Connect gathering. So if you're signed up for that, and maybe even if not, we would love to have you. There are so many amazing things going on, and we just don't want you to forget that the cards in front of you are amazing ways to plug in. You can drop those in the boxes in the back, and we are just so excited for what God has. Yes, thank you, Preston, for, Pastor Preston, for your message. And if there is any way that we can pray for you, rejoice with you, we have an amazing team that would love to do this. So have a great week, Riches, and we'll see you back next week.